I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here on BPM. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Big shout out to our patrons. Thank you once again for your support. And I'm very happy, uh, and I hope you appreciate it, to to be able to offer to this offer this to you first. Uh, and uh, just as a little shout out, a bit of a, 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 a nod of appreciation at minimum. Uh, but uh, uh, so again, thank you very much. Long story short, in conversation with 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 a, with a buddy of mine, it came back to to my attention uh, uh, something that I had never really picked up on or paid much attention to before, which is uh, in my previous uh, engagement with exchange dealings with Marissa Baradaran around her work uh, and uh, around banking and wealth and race, et cetera, uh, or multiple interviews and whatnot sort of lost sight of the fact that she at one point did try to become the comptroller in the, uh, uh, of the United States in the Biden administration. And uh, it was not successful. And the why is not successful is kind of interesting. And then it was a nice, I think, reminder that she had some important and I think nice things to say about my work. So I thought we would revisit that in the context of this this previous uh, unsuccessful attempt to get into the Biden administration. So a couple of things before I run the clip. Uh, but all right, so if we start with this article from August 2021, New York Times, uh, in in the run up to the eventual selection of of Saul Omarova, who is uh, uh, the current comptroller. This article starts to outline or summarizes some of the issues that were facing Marissa Baradaran's effort to to get to that to that level, or to get that selection, or to be selected. Uh, so as it says here, the, again, this is from 2021, the White House is vetting Sa- Saul, Saule uh, Omarova, a Cornell professor for the role of comptroller of the currency. Her work has highlighted the risks of, of cryptocurrency for banks. Probably something else I should look more into because she she was talking at the time about the threat that the cryptocurrencies meant to the banking system and not in the way that pro cryptocurrency people were advocating that it would be in the terms of threatening the dollar per se but but the point was if people start investing in mass amounts into cryptocurrencies and it collapses that will drag down other aspects of the banking industry but but this is what's relevant i think for for our purposes today which i thought was interesting the first candidate that was being considered by biden was Michael S. Barr, an Obama administration official who drew criticism from progressives who said he was too deferential to banks when the Dodd-Frank regulatory package was being negotiated after the 2008 financial crisis. And Marissa Baradaran, a banking law professor who was a favorite of progressives, was attacked by Mr. Barr's supporters for lacking management experience and the support of moderate Democrats. Both were dropped after administration officials concluded that neither was likely to garner enough support to be confirmed. And that line there is, I think, instructive for the moment that that Baradaran was not likely to get enough support from moderate Democrats, meaning that she was too progressive even for moderates and too progressive for someone who had even been supported and selected by the Obama administration. Message. All right, and just a little bit more here as we move to uh, another New York Times story from a little bit later in 2021, in September of 2021. We see a little bit more of the same that progressives are seething over Biden's likely pick for banking regulator. Uh, and the concern, uh, as was reported in, I'm sorry, this was January. Oh, it was updated in September of 2021. That's right. That's what I was looking at. Uh, President Biden is leaning towards nominating Michael S. Barr, a law professor and former Obama administration official, to the p- position of comptroller of the currency, according to two people familiar with the process. Okay, so this was earlier in the year before both were being, but this was before both would later be dropped, so to speak. Uh, 
But the prospect has dismayed many progressive groups that would prefer Marissa Baradaran, a law professor who has written about how banks treat black people and the poor. On Friday, one uh, one supporter of, of Ms. Baradaran emailed the entire Biden in, in, transition team announcing that he would go on a hunger strike if Ms., Mr. Barr was confirmed. Uh, it was considered a high stakes regulation, uh, 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 high stakes, the, the, the high, the, it was considered to, the, the appointment to the position was considered to be one that is of high stakes because it is uh, uh, around regulation of the banking industry. Uh, the Office of the Control of the Currency decides which companies can do banking business in the United States and set standards for banks' activities in poor and minority communities. And again, I think this is important because as we review this clip of a previous discussion I had uh, at the initial book launch with Marissa Baradaran and Nathan Connolly, uh, you can see that she's interested in my argument in around public policy. And recognizes the 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 value in it, and even asks me why do I think so few are focused on that. In other words, why are so many of us encouraged to be focused on looking at saving our money and investing and doing all the things that, in her own work, she explains does not work. When we should be focused on political power or public policy. Now, we may disagree about what political power looks like, how to get it, how ultimately it would be wielded, et cetera, and so forth. But what she is correct in, in, and where she agrees with me on is that that's the, that's the issue. And that's why I think she was willing to take that position or, you know, I, I think beyond just her own career aspirations, I think that she, given her work, I take her at her word, is interested in a more equitable society. She does so on the basis of, I think, more liberal politics, obviously, than what we, I or we would be interested in. But but to that end, she understands how the system works, and the system works through public policy and who has the control of the, over the, the uh, political apparatus of a society. And I think that's why she was ultimately not selected, because she was too far left, even for uh, the Biden or the Obama administration. So obviously, therefore, the Biden administration, the Obama administration, and therefore the Biden. I think I said that right. Yeah. They also said she lacked experience in government, which she did, relatively speaking. But the real issue, of course, is that she was too far left even for the moderate Democrats who were not going to tolerate someone that interested in so-called minorities and the poor. So that said, let's just revisit this, this, this shining moment where, where someone of that caliber at that level is once again in agreement with me and supportive of my work. Thanks again, everybody. Peace if you're willing to fight for it, like Fred Hampton used to say, catch you next time. But let's go to the tape. So Marissa, I, I did want to start with you because because I uh, uh, and in some of the earlier drafts of the book, I don't mind sharing, uh, some of my friends had to say, you're, you're leaning on her work too much. Um, <laughs> and, you know, as good as it may be, you know, you should expand the, the and I was saying but but it is so new and it is so good and it's yeah, so comprehensive and I've read it so closely and so recently to be fair you know yeah yeah so I so my one that's what like you, my my editor had to write me no more Baldwin quotes like, <laughs> like, what? like my whole book was like look James Baldwin said it better so I'm just gonna right 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 she's like say it in your own words I'm like what are you talking Okay, like what's my words versus James? Like, let me just quote him. So I, I well, that's how to I take felt. out. Yeah, no. So first of all, because my chapter was going to be the chapter on banking is so short, and I, I didn't. There's so much to say in 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 so little space. And it was either you and, and Earl O'Fari with the myth of black capitalism that they kept saying, Jared, please refer. You know we know you've read other people's work. Maybe you want to let readers of this book know you've read other people's work instead of just saying, well, Earl and Marissa said. Well, anyway. <laughs> there's so, so my there's, one question is... Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. There's such a dearth of, of, 
of text though. I mean, as you know, like having done this research, like I, I wrote the book because I was like, surely there's a library of books dealing with this issue. Of, of, of black banking, black economic power, surely, right? And I turned up with Afari and, and uh, Ab Abram Harris, you know, the 1936 uh, like pamphlet that is the last, and then there's like a, a smattering of articles, but mostly of the laudatory kind, right? Of mm -hmm. look at the, you know, and so there really just wasn't the literature and I am still actually confused as to why not. And so when I found your stuff, then like you were already talking about this, um, and I was really amazed someone sent me one of your YouTube videos after they heard about my project. They were like, this guy's doing this, right? And so I, I just, I don't understand actually why, you know, even someone like Andrew Brimmer, who you quote, um, you know, could have been like one of the reigning figures in this counter movement. And I, and I guess my question to you is like, why do you think that this other, um, you know, the myth, the myth has taken such hold, this idea of, of black buying power, but also of um, get, gaining economic power as opposed to political. And I just wanna, while I'm talking, just talk about your last sentence here, which I thought was like such a powerful, says the meaning of power must be reclaimed and understood, not as resulting from consumption, but as organized, collective and mass political action, right? Um, and, and obviously other people have said it, but. I just wonder why why is there not more uh, people talking about that? Well, you know, one of the I, I think one of the pro well one of the issues is of course that it's a critique of of capitalism and you know black or whatever prefix we want to give it. Mm -hmm. It's ultimately a critique of capitalism, and I think that that is always a problem uh, in this society in this country. But the other part that this is actually, and this is the hardest, and you know why I'm going to be talking uh, uh, with, with several others, including my, 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 my comrade uh, Todd Stephen Burroughs about the black press, because one of the problems that I think that we have to confront is that the, the commercial black press has played a, a tremendous role in promoting black capitalism, black entrepreneurialism, black banking, buy black. Um, in part to capture corporate advertising dollars. Uh, and so to convince those spending, I don't know, somewhere around $600 billion every year on advertising that some of that should go to black media, there was a sort of this, this uncomfortable relationship that, that developed between the black commercial press, the white commercial press, and the corporate in, world in general to say, hey, we have people that can buy some of those products. If you spend money on us to advertise those products to them, they'll buy them. So I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, in conjunction with, you know, a, just a, an attack of political movements and social movements that would have promoted other critiques that, that you know, um, I think that's part of it uh, uh, as to why we don't see anybody raising these questions or even talking about, because of course I learned about Brimmer from YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. even to learn about critics of black capitalism or black banking or buying power from the perspective of a quote unquote more mainstream, even quote unquote conservative critic, it's hard to hear. Uh, it's easy to dismiss the lunatics like me on the left and others, you know, so-called mm -hmm. radicals or whatever, but mm -hmm. even that, argument, which I found fascinating learning from you in particular, uh, uh, and, and Nathan as well, is like, well, wow, how could, if, if they can't enter the conversation, I'm certainly not going to be able to. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, so I, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that's somewhat of, of what I'm, what I'm thinking is, is, has to be part of it at least, is that, uh, you know. I mean, this is, I mean, so, so, okay, two, two things. One is um, you should go watch, there's a Freedmen's Bank Symposium at Treasury that happened like a month ago. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like nine hours, but just a few opening gambits are worth it. There's one uh, where Steve Mnuchin is being interviewed by some big, um, you know, I think African-American finance expert uh, who I didn't, I wasn't familiar with, but he's just like lauding him about like, oh, we're so grateful and the Freedmen's Bank was such a great idea and all this stuff. And it's just, it's mind blowing, but it's depressing, right? Um, it's just this idea that, you know, every single speaker that is chosen, I mean, you and I and Nathan weren't, we weren't invited, right? To this big Freedmen's <laughs> Bank. Like it was all, like it was all 
uh, you know, black bankers, black, there's, you know, it's like tons of, it's lots of representation, but everyone with the same message, which is this is the way and this is the path. And it was really depressing. But what was heartbreaking is reading Carter Woodson's book that came right after the Great Depression as all the banks failed and all the banks, including black banks, but every bank, like the entire country failed. And he is saying it was your fault to the black community for not keeping your mm. money in the bank. And you, it was your, like, if you had just done this, we would have survived this. And he's just so mad. And, and it was, that's heartbreaking, right? That's, that is just, um, uh, and it does feel, but it does also feel like the idea of waiting for politics seems also to be uh, just naive, you know? And this is where, you know, Du Bois mm -hmm. is like, you know, like waiting for a white God. So Du Bois goes to black banking because he's just like, there's no, like we can wait all the day long for white society to do something for us or you just kind of do it yourself. And so there is that sense, right? Like I think the Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey tradition of black ownership of stuff is just like, because they're never, they're never going to come along, right? And this is a majoritarian democracy. And you have anything that benefits a minority that is interpreted, it, and it always is interpreted as bad for the majority is never going to happen, ever. And so in that system, there is a sense in which you, you, you look at yourself and you say, this is like an anti-colonial fight. And the way you do it is to gain sovereignty and control. And in that scenario where it's like, then just go all the way, right? You might as well gain sovereignty and control mm. as opposed to just going halfway and just trying to get banks because that, that's not going to do it. But maybe control of the school system and the, the fire department and the you know, actual like structures of power might be one path, but, but this is not that. And um, I mean, what I, what I really appreciate about your book, and I guess it, that's why it led my, to my first question, is, is this idea of like the marketplace of ideas that you do so well and just tracing the modern, you know, that you've, the fact that you have Killer Mike in the same sentence as you have, you know, some, some conservative, right? Like, this is, this is an idea that takes hold uh, and it lies deep and, and it, it is not only withstands time, uh, it withstands data. It goes across the political spectrum, you know, and, and I think, you know, I, I, I love that you kind of stress that and, and your personal experiences and just trying to rebut this, you know, and, 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 you know, when I think about the marketplace of ideas, you know, you do think like there are, um, you know, like Booker T. Washington, I try to highlight, you know, he is the person that the industrialist chose uh, as a black leader. I mean, he was a gifted orator and all this stuff, but there isn't a marketplace, right? Um, but on the other hand, like, you know, I, like Martin Luther King is actually just like very effective and very, um, he just understands the structural elements, but he's able to do so much good in that marketplace of ideas. And so I, I don't mean to be just purely negative because I do think the marketplace sometimes does choose the spokesman that it appeals to it. But I think MLK's is, is a spokesman that gets under the skin and, and forces it. Now, of course, MLK post-64 is not as effective as MLK pre-64, <laughs> right? But, but, but so it was a misunderstanding of MLK that gets more, you know, um, uh, you know speed than anything else. But, um, I, you know, I think that that is something that I, um, I puzzle over just across the board. I mean, you, you look at right now at who are the Black voices and, you know, or any sort of per person who's anti-capitalist. And, and there are moments where I think that message does have salience. And I think, you know, uh, uh, I think this may be one where, um, you know, people who have been saying, you know, to the Federal Reserve, hey, why don't you use your monetary policy powers to give people money? Uh, we were seen as extremists, you know, whatever, commies, whatever. And now, the Federal Reserve is doing that under the guy. I mean, this is like under the guise of, you know, monetary policy stimulus, but, but, you know, so I, I think um, there are like weak spots and this is me putting on my optimistic hat talking. So I think your book is coming at a point where uh, I think a lot of people are saying like, maybe what we were upholding wasn't worth upholding. Um, I, I don't know. So I hope, I mean, Oh, 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 oh,